Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide. We're ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Senior Journalist Richard, and with me is Managing Editor Head of Video Matt. Hello. And also National Treasure and Regular Contributor Byron Matthew Darkus. Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking, just be quiet. Yes. <laughs> James James Cleary, our usual podcast host, he's our deputy editor as well. It's away, as he always is at this time of year. He's working at the Royal Easter Show, uh, where he operates the Freakout Ride. Now, oh, according yeah. to the Royal Easter Show website, uh, the Freakout Ride is a sensational, thrilling ride with long, swinging arms, eight thousand LED lights, and music to get your freak on as you swing and rotate through a multitude of smooth moves. And this is just uh, so James doing it with his hands, right? It's, it's, it's actually just James giving swings right, right <laughs> on it with his own body. Um, mm. The freak out ride. So good luck, James. He always comes back one arm's longer than the other, always at this time of year, but <laughs> he's a fit man and he's, and he's built for it. Yep. Um, this week, we're looking at how the Aussie classic car market is going gangbusters. Uh, we're also going to be discussing what cars we've had in our garage. And we'll be catching up with the second richest person on the planet in Muskwatch. Now, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline too. So let's go. Now, the main topic for today's podcast is Aussie old cars and how they're fetching ridiculous, ridiculous prices. Uh, we had an HSV GTR SR. Malu W1 hit 1.05 million in January this year. Uh, and then along came a 1971 Ford Falcon GTHO Phase 3, and that became the highest selling classic car at $1.15 million. That's a classic Australian car. Um, that's outrageous. We're going to be talking about how that's possible. Uh, and also, look, it might be a little bit late for people to jump on that classic car bandwagon. Um, and Matt, and Byron and myself are going to be trying to help you find out what is a future classic as well. So, but first of all, Matt Campbell, how like these cars were never worth this much money when they first no. came out. Why are they why are they worth this much now? What's going on? I think it's um, partly to do with rarity and also reminiscence. I think there's a lot of people out there who are ruining the day when um, the the Ford and a Ford and Holden and even Mitsubishi to a degree and Toyota um, shut their doors for Australian production. Um, and now we don't have Aussie made cars anymore. And mm. uh, we will never have Aussie made cars again in all likelihood. Um, and so it makes sense that there's a level of, I guess, uh, desire to have a piece of Aussie history in your garage. I would love to have um an older Holden. I've had a few old Holdens in my time. Um, I've had a HD wagon, which was actually my first car ever at the age of 14. And I've had a HR wagon as well. Um, and I loved both of them dearly, um, but not enough to keep them because, you know, I was a, a impatient youngster and didn't think to see the value of those cars in the future. And if I had either one of those cars now, I could be um, not working anymore. <laughs> but no, they're, they're not worth that much. But the the, mm. the values of these sorts of older Holdens and, and older Fords is astonishing. Obviously, there's, there's I think there's um, different echelons of these collectible cars. There's the standard, you know, the, the clean old cars that are fetching, you know, mm. thirty to $50,000 and they're, you know, 50-year-old Holdens or Fords. But then there's there's these X race cars that have this providence that no other car has. And those are the sort of cars where you're going, well, to have that in your garage, no one else is ever going to have that car. And there's that's why people are paying the same as a Sydney apartment for a piece of rolling memorabilia. Um, Byron, you're a keen car collector. What do you think? Are you on the same page as me on this? Oh, absolutely. And um, you're right. It is nostalgia and maybe a bit of regret. Also, I think there's an element of um, uh, maybe pride, nationalistic pride, in that we were able to produce cars that were not only 
like fast, but world standard fast. Like mm. we all know that the GTHO Phase Three Falcon was the fastest accelerating uh, or fastest four door sedan in the, in, in the world back in 1971. That sort of thing, you know, to a petrol head or to just car enthusiasts like us is is you know, it's like NASA moonshot style, you know, like um, achievements and. Um, it, it's something that we won't have again, certainly not in the foreseeable future. And um, and with that and the brain drain that goes from just not having people or kids aspire to be engineers and designers and or racing car drivers, um, that all plays into it as, as well, I think. So, um, and yeah, you're right. The cars that, you know, that you, we, I mean, as a kid, I'm in my 50s, as a kid, I used to see HK and HT and HG Monaro two doors going for a song even those things are six-figure cars now mm. like absolutely yeah. even 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 the non you know uh top grades of cars like i had a uh, xw falcon 500 a couple of, a few years ago and it was not a gt it was not a gs it wasn't a gtho but i had someone buy it off me for quite a bit of money just because it was the same shape it was, you know, it was the, you know, it was just a Falcon 500. Um, but, you know, he bought it sight unseen and I drove it to him and I asked him, you know, what, what he was going to do with it. And he told me that, you know, I'm in my, in my seventies now. And, um, you know, I, I, I pass up the opportunity to have one of these when I was 19 and, uh, you know, I've got a few of my mates who have, um, you know, fallen off their purchase and I don't want to, I don't want to miss the opportunity to own one. So, and he was going to do a ground up rebuild of wow. that car and wanted to turn it into a, you know, a GT replica. And even the replicas um, are selling for a lot of, of money as well. Yeah. Um, I was, I was just browsing um, in, in Neil's story, which you'll find uh, in the description and also on the cars guide site um, that there's, there are replicas going for, six figures which yeah. you know is is quite phenomenal uh, there's a on the slattery's um auctions at the moment um, there's still three days left of bidding in this 1970 uh gtho phase three replica which the current bidding is at one hundred and fifteen thousand yeah. dollars. yeah and it's a replica it's not the this isn't the real deal but there's this desire so much desire to have that car, even if it isn't that car, it's a representation of what that moment meant for Australia and, and what it has meant in the 50 years since then. And why not? Yeah. And why wouldn't you? Like, if, for all intents and purposes, it projects the real thing. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, the real thing comparative to today won't, wouldn't feel as blindingly fast. I mean, you know, mm. why cars that do 14 seconds, then quarter mile? yeah that are new for yeah. a fraction of the price but um yeah it it it, it still has the style and this and the aroma and the feel and the drama and the theater the theater of um <laughs> of of classic cardam but what blows my mind is cars that you know that weren't actually classics in their day by any stretch like cortinas and mm. and and sunbirds mm. And things like that, that are, and Tiranas, of course, like like four cylinder HB and LC Tiranas, they're in in original rust free condition. They're fifty thousand dollars now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep, Grays Online has got. I know we were giving plugs out left, right, and center here, but I, I think it's all neutral territory when we're talking about you know classic cars. Um, has a Ford Falcon XB Coupe. Now you know. A, a nice car, but nothing particularly special. Oh, no, unless, you're a, unless you're a Mad Max fan, though. Yeah. Unless you're a Mad Max fan and you're an Interceptor yeah. fan. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. 50, its current bid is $50,609. $50,609. $50, as you said, Byron and, and Matt, you know, even like, you know, Commodore VSs and VTs, you know, these are the kind of the forgotten sort of, you know, children of the, the Commodore family. Um, are also going for outrageous prices. Yeah. So looking at what cars are on the market, new cars are on the market now, and let's say that in 30 years' time, if somebody wants to buy a classic right now, a future classic, what cars out there do you think people should be um, closeting away uh, for, for a rainy day? Ford Endura. Oh. Really? <laughs> to no one ever. <laughs> 
<laughs> I thought you were being serious. Ed. Oh, Byron. Oh. Um, I, I would think um, if you had your hands on uh, an early version of the first uh, Toyota 86, there's a second generation coming out soon. Mm. If you had an early Toyota 86 or even a Subaru BRZ in, in 30 years' time, if it hasn't been drifted or crashed, yep. crashed, um, you could be sitting on a gold mine because the, those values, they dropped to a certain point pre-COVID. Uh, and since COVID, obviously, the entire used car market has gone a bit silly. Mm. Um, and they haven't gone below that $14,000 sort of range. Um, and I think Ford Fiesta ST uh, is sort of in the same sort of situation. I think those two cars, they're not necessarily new cars, but they are newer examples um, that I would think have huge potential as future collectibles. Byron? I, I agree. I was going to say the Fiesta ST um, or the Focus ST because also you get a feeling that those European Fords aren't going to be around for much longer in terms mm -hmm. of uh, because of emissions and also minuscule sales. Um, it was hard enough getting the Fiesta ST over the line in Australia in the first place, the current one. So um, that's very astute. I totally agree, uh, Matt. That's, that's one of them. Um, also, uh, coupes are going the same way. So yeah. I reckon a Tiburon, uh, not a Tiburon, <laughs> a Velosta, a Hyundai Velosta. Oh, yeah. Um, a Mazda MX-5 RF. They, these cars that are on the endangered mm. list. Well, things like, yeah, I was Sirocco, Volkswagen Sirocco was, mm. was on that endangered list and was, was axed all together. What about the Up, the Sirocco uh, <laughs> type of thing? Oh, have you heard of the Up? <laughs> <laughs> um, just for context, everyone, uh, both Byron and myself have owned Ups, uh, Volkswagen Up. If you're not aware, uh, it was a very, very Popular. limited car uh, in Australia, 2,200 sales. I miss my Up. Me too. Um, I, used to refer to it, I used to refer to it as the ARP. <laughs> the ARP uh, from Germany. This is Deutschland. Deutschland. I think in terms of motoring journalists, the ARP was is probably been the most popular car um, amongst yeah. you know car yeah. car reviewers. Um, there's Richard, there's a you, lot of us. Do you have a crystal ball that um, says anything in particular with the current crop of new yeah. cars or, I, or recent look, cars? I think Audi TT. Um, uh, especially that, what is it, 2000, no, sorry, 1998 was when it came out, wasn't it? 1998, 99. Um, I reckon those in the same way that, you know, a 2012, 13 BRZ or 86 would be, you know, a collectible item oh, in, who, who in about 30 years. Who would be enough to buy a TT though? Oh, come on, mate. <laughs> I actually have one, ladies and gents. Uh, I have... I have a 2001 Quattro manual uh, coupe and um, I got it for a very good price at auction. Um, and I, you know, speculatively, it was one of these, I think this could make me a fair bit of money purchases. Mm. Uh, I also always wanted to own one. Um, and so it was pretty fortunate that I managed to get this one for so such an affordable price. Um, and it does have its issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyone who's looked into uh, TT ownership knows that these cars aren't perfect. They are far from perfect. And there's a lot of people out there who have spent a lot more than the purchase price just keeping it on the road. Mine hasn't been too problematic, thankfully. Um, a few little fixes, but um, I, I am planning to have a few uh, cosmetic rectifications made in the next couple of weeks. So um, hoping to bring it back to um, at least closer to new standard. So, and it's, it's just a car that I don't need, but I wanted. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that Richard, you're right. And I actually think that the um, final versions of the current TT will be collectibles as well because mm. um, that the TT will die. It's It's been announced. Um, there might be an ETT at a later date. Uh, but ETA for the ETT? Uh, <laughs> who knows? Who knows, yeah. <laughs> um, well, but, I, I hear you, mate, and I you inspired me because I had to run out and buy my own TT-style car and I ended up with... Um, a Toyota Paseo. <laughs> oh, no. uh, so that's like, the, I, I would say that's the working man, thinking man's, like the, the, the uh, you know, the and very uh, kind of bargain basement coupe investment. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you, mate. Yeah. Didn't Ford also share Paseo with, was it Fiesta? 
Festiva um, in the 90s? No? No. Oh, my God. No. I'm, no, it's, no. I, for some reason, I thought there was a bit of a connection there. But, look, I think maybe Chrysler 300 um, SRT could be a future classic. And also we're, we're going for, we're, we're not actually sort of thinking in terms of uh, 2021 terms here because SUVs are the, the most popular cars at the moment. So maybe things like BMW X5s um, could be a future classic in 30 years time or, you know, um, Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT uh, could be also a future classic. Um, God, the Jimny Again, Matt, I think you're a, you're a Jimny owner as well. Is there a car you don't own? And Byron, no. that's a question for you too. Uh, uh, well, uh, I'll go first this one because before we uh, what cars do you have? Well, no, I was just going to say that uh, the little SUV thing is something that both Matt and I have spent quite a few late nights uh, toing and froing over on the uh, on the uh, on the messenger stream. Um, I reckon that things like uh, early Rav Four Toodles. Ooh. And uh, yes. my personal favourite, the Mitsubishi Pajero Eo, that sort of thing. Definitely. Or the Evo, even. Oh, the mm. Evo, yeah. Those yeah. sort of things are definitely on their way up, I think, simply because they would have been trashed or destroyed uh, or crashed. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, and that's, my, that's my hot tip. The four-wheel drive scene is its own beast um, yes like there's there's uh 60 series land cruisers mm. um there was one that sold at auction in america recently for seventy six thousand dollars us wow. um and it was a pristine example with very low mileage um but there are you know cars now uh 60 series and 80 series land cruisers here that are you know, with 400,000 kilometres on them, well-used cars um, that are going for thirty to 40,000 Aussie dollars. And this is, th these cars, um, it's, a, it's a product of the moment, I think, because COVID, because you can't travel overseas, because money's cheap, because you can cash in some of your super and get a bit of cash and just have something that you want. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are indulging um, and probably wrongfully so i would say to a degree um there's a lot of uh expense out there for cars that you know i wonder what happens in five to ten years time to all these cars that people have bought up at stupid premiums they're mm. obviously going to depreciate or well, some of them some of them will keep going but others a lot i think will <laughs> drop back down yeah yeah um with the and to that list you've just reminded me if you were shrewd, shrewd enough to have bought and maintained a Toyota FJ Cruiser, mm -hmm. they have simply gone one direction. Yeah. Just like your favourite band, <laughs> one direction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you raise a really, really good point, guys, because, you know, people are spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on these cars. Um, is, is the bottom going to drop out of the market completely? Uh, you know, uh, or, or are they going to become even more valuable? I mean, we're heading towards, um, you know, a future that's going to be electric um, soon or very, very soon. We've got Jaguar saying that they're not going to be producing any more combustion engine cars after 2025. Mm -hmm. and, and and all the other mark car makers are sort of heading that direction as well. Uh, is, is that going to make, you know, combustion engine cars even more desirable? You know, will a Ford Focus be you know, a highly collectible car in, you know, in 30 years time, that type of thing. Um, we're going to move on now to the cars in our garage. Uh, maybe, Matt, this could be a future classic. Um, oh. You know, we didn't touch on utes, but maybe utes could be. Um, Matt, the Ford Ranger FX4 has been in your garage. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, yes, um, that's it there. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that car there. That's the FX4 Max. So it's a... It's a, they did an FX4 before. This one's the Max, which basically is designed to fill the gap between the regular Ranger lineup and the Raptor. So it gets some Raptor bits, including the 17-inch uh, alloy wheels, uh, the BF Goodrich tyres, and the Fox Shocks suspension. But at the back, instead of having coils, it's got leaf springs. So the purpose, essentially, of this FX4 Max is that it 
can still be an off-road weapon because it's got those Fox shock absorbers, which are excellent. Um, there's also some um, steering knuckle and stabiliser bar changes at the front, um, which make it a very nice ute to drive in most situations. But um, the point of it is that it's designed to not have the limitations of a Raptor. Um, so it's, well, not that it plays to the car's advantage, but it is narrower. I mean, if you're off-roading, narrower is slightly better in some instances, but also um, it's $10,000 cheaper than a Raptor. It's got 3.5 tonne towing and a Raptor has 2.5 tonne and it's got 228 kilos of extra payload. So it's a considerably more work-ready vehicle than a Raptor. Um, and I think that that's what Ford's trying to get at with this vehicle. As you can see um, from that image uh, and the images you'll be seeing on YouTube, um, I did put it through its paces both in towing and in a load test. Um, the towing part was uh, 2.3 ton uh, wood chipper, which we got uh, and towed behind it and did 140 kilometers or something of towing. And it performed admirably. Like it's it's one of those utes where I was, I was sort of sitting there going, can, can you actually feel that there's something behind you? The only time you can is when you go up a hill and the gearbox is a little busy because um, it's got 10 speed auto. Yeah. Um, it's that two litre bi-turbo engine only uh, with the 10 speed auto only. Um, and that means that it can be a little busy uh, as it's trying to keep you in your hot spot for the torque. Mm -hmm. um, but towing, it was excellent. Um, and doing the load test, it was also really, really good. Uh, we put 800 kilos of sandbags in the back. Um, so we were just just under the payload limit for the vehicle with myself, Sam, the videographer, and a bit of other kit in the bags uh, in the back of the car. And it was, yeah, it was really surprisingly excellent. I actually think it was the best Ranger I've ever driven um, with a load and towing, which says a lot because they're all really, really good. But I know that uh, other people have driven this car and not uh, found it to be the best Ranger you can get. It is a, it is a compromise. It's expensive. Um, that's one thing. But also it, uh, those Fox shocks uh, can have some, uh, can throw up some concerns off-road, I believe, from what I've heard from um, Crafty in particular. He did an off-road test with it recently and he found the ride to be a little bit unpleasant or unbalanced. Um, but also, you know, he sort of he sort of questioned like, well, if you're going this far, wouldn't you just get a Raptor anyway? Um, and, and he's a winger. He's a winger, though. <laughs> this is true. A... Uh, for me, like spending sixty five thousand dollars on a mm. Ute is unfathomable. Spending yeah. seventy five thousand dollars is like, well, maybe you just would. You yeah. know, if you don't need the towing and you don't care about the payload and you're just going for the look. Has this oh. come? Has the FX4 come about because people have complained that the Raptor wasn't able to carry a load in the back properly or tow properly? And as 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 Ford released this in a particular grade or you know almost standalone model because of that feedback, I um, think there's been a, complaints. There's been a lot of whinging from potential customers about the towing issue. Yeah. So even though probably ninety five percent of people who will tow a large caravan might not ever go anywhere near three and a half ton towing. Yeah. Um, it's the mental mindset. That's where the market, that's where the class is. And that's where you need to be if you want bragging rights. Yeah. Can and you so, tow my can you tow my imagination? You know, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that's part of the um the reasoning behind adding this car because it is um it it does fill that gap. It does allow you to have um, I would say the best of both worlds to a degree, but then again, you know, you could just get yourself an XLT, um, which also has a higher payload and well, higher payload than that rides beautifully, steers excellent and has 3.5 ton towing as well. So, you yeah. know, it's yeah. really what you want. Like, and I guess, you know, I, I often look at the Ford Ranger lineup and go, how can there be so many derivatives? Yeah. And there's so many special editions and they're always adding something. And that's why that car has maintained its relevancy in this market because it's constantly evolving. They're constantly listening to what people are asking for. They do quarterly updates for that car. 
So yeah. instead of like some some manufacturers might do an MY21 and then an MY22 model year update. Ford does quarterly updates. So every three months, something's being changed or altered or added or removed from the spec list. And that's across the range. So they're, they're dynamic. And this is that's because they see this, this is their cash cow. It's yep. making them um, huge profits in that part of the market. And it's class competitive and or in some respects, class leading, I would argue. Well, that's um, so that's the Ranger car company. You're right. To yeah. a T, isn't it? Um, yeah. Ford simply can't afford to uh, to get this car wrong. And mm-hmm. I completely agree with what you said. Um, oh, my God, those stripes actually look pretty cool as well on the <laughs> FX4. Um, however, uh, it is a dated car. It is a car that uh, you feel is probably near the end of its life, and we know it is because it's a new, new generation model uh, imminent. Uh, but, you know, kudos to Ford Australia's engineers that, they have a 10-year lead or head start. Um, sorry, he's, they've given the competition a 10-year head start and they still haven't caught up in so many key areas with their respective trucks. No, whether they cost $50,000, $40,000 or eighty dollars or $100,000, the Ranger is still on top and so suited to Australian conditions. You're absolutely right there. Yep. Matt, that car uh, has struck a chord for a whole bunch of reasons and why not milk it? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. Now, Byron, uh, you've been in something quite different. You've been in a range of cars. Mm-hmm. You've got some new additions to. Are you up to h- how many cars in your own personal collection now? Are there? Uh, I, I, I've only got a couple. <laughs> I only have a couple. Yeah. Um, you read that? Uh, uh, does that say fifteen? <laughs> wow. But uh, yeah, only a couple. But. Uh, um, which one shall I start with, the newer one or the older one? Which one? Let's let's start let's start with the newer one, the car okay. that you've been currently testing. Okay, the car yeah. I'm totally currently, currently testing. It's a modest little thing. Uh, it's probably coming up right now, somewhere here. It's there it the, is. It's the um, all new W two two three S class by Mercedes Benz, a car that um, pretty much has held the mantle as the perceived best car in the world. And uh, this is a what a sixty uh, it's sixty it's actually celebrating its sixtieth anniversary as a post war uh, series that started with the nineteen fifty one Pontum uh, Mercedes uh, and then became the S class with the classic W one one six from nineteen seventy two which our friend Mal Flynn has as you know anyway seven generations on this is the um, this is the pinnacle of la- upper large luxury uh, sedans. And in true S-class fashion, it's pushed boundaries. Um, from a uh, technological point of view, it's, I think it's the first production car with rear airbags. So the airbags that in the long wheelbase version, uh, the rear passengers are facing. Uh, so they're built into the back of the front seats. Wow. Provide yet another level of, um, of passive safety. I can't, I can't understand why, uh, you know, it's taken this long for rear passengers to have airbags positioned yeah. that way already. I mean, you, you look at, if you, you know, morbidly, I watch a lot of crash tests just to sort of find <laughs> out exactly where the airbags are in cars before I write about them. Mm. And those rear passengers, although they've got curtain airbags um, in, you know, most cases, their seat belts are the only real things that are sort of stopping them from, and even in most cases don't, from hitting the, the seats in front of them. It's yeah. pretty violent in the back there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and look, as we know over the years, um, the technology in S-classes is filtered down through the Mercedes-Benz ranks and then often to the rest of the mainstream, you know, car Correct. industry. Correct, although the um, weirdly, in a weird juxtaposition, um, the Toyota Yaris kind of... Um, uh, sees that and matches it with its um, <laughs> with its front uh, airbags uh, position between the uh, front pass- passenger seats to provide yeah. lateral uh, support. So um, you're right; that's that sort of thing is com- uh, comes from at different directions. But the the S class um, also has um, progressed in terms of refinement, um, in terms of keeping noise, vibration, harshness levels down in um, in really clever ways, and that car really you're really cocooned in a first-class environment, whether you're in the front or the back seat. 
and that's what you want from an S class. Um, it's got multimedia um, progress in terms of having the first three D um, instrumentation pod where you're looking at it and you're seeing a three D map in front of you or optionally in the head up display uh, that kind of immerses you in, in that kind of almost um, oh, in that virtual world of driving where you're keeping your eyes on the road, but it's also there in a, um, in that 3d format for you to, and or to enhance your, uh, your, your understanding of your environment. Uh, that's another level where the Mercedes just absolutely shines, but, Probably the most impressive thing about the S-Class, besides the fact that it is a return to super high quality, over-engineered um, goodness that, the, that you know, classic and traditional Mercedes are known for. The thing that impresses me most about this, this W223, certainly in the S450 three-litre turbo petrol guys that I drove, is its ability to absolutely shrink around you uh, when you're hustling up a mountain pass. And we, the drive route took us via the, um, the Dandenon Ranges here in Melbourne. And that car absolutely handles like, well, I wouldn't say a hot hatch, but it's body control. It's, um, it's faithfulness to where you want it to go is amazing. And it's got air suspension. It's, uh, the air suspension is standard on these cars. So you're, you are, you're simultaneously um, cocooned in this luxury, you know, barge that actually also handles like a C-class sedan would. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And the aroma and the, the attention to detail inside and the fact that the car has a majesty and a capability that has restored that series to where it has traditionally been. And I think that it hasn't really um, equaled since maybe the W126 of the uh, 80s and early 90s and maybe its success of the w140 so yes the s class is pretty expensive from 250 odd grand um in australia partly due to the luxury car tax uh but you know even these models that are 300,000 k plus have um present a compelling reason to you know to study harder at school when you're younger and you know <laughs> or to or to um you know be you know to, to, to aspire to these sort of things. They are amazing to drive. And I, I remember going to a launch a few years ago for, for the S-Class. And um, I think that a lot, most, most people who, who uh, have an S-Class probably sit in the back seat. Um, but I think that they're missing out because, as you said, driving an S-Class is, is not how you'd imagine it to be. And the route they took us on through the, you know, the, the wild woods of, um, you know, out of Melbourne, um, on some twisty roads, which is so good. And I couldn't believe that this enormous, like, battleship of a car was handling the way that it did. I remember coming to the first corner and thinking, oh, this is not going to be nice. Um, but it went around that corner unbelievably, like it, exactly like it was, a you know, a C63 or something like that. It was incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you have got um, a new edition, but it's an old, 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 old car. Yes, uh, it's your latest addition to your mm-hmm. to the Byron uh, car family. That's right. Um, That's do you want right. to tell us a little bit about yeah. this one? It, it also starts with M. Yes, but instead of being a Mercedes, it's a Morris. Yay! Uh, it, it's a Morris Minor One Thousand. That's a bit Morris. small. How do you it's get into little. that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is small. So <laughs> this uh, this is a this is only representation of the car I bought. Uh, so the car and it's. It's on its way to Melbourne. I've bought it um, sight unseen in Tasmania. I've been searching for a Morris Minor for a long time. Now, I've, my first classic car when I was uh, in my early 20s back in 1988 was a 1956 Series 2 split screen with the 803cc um, A-Series engine. And so that was my – I cut my teeth um, – in terms of trying to keep old cars going and yep. you know, having a classic because that's a side valve engine as well, didn't it? Uh, that, that one was not. That was an overhead valve. Um, oh, yeah. Minor ceased being side valve when uh, it merged with when BMC was created when Morris uh, um, merged with rival Austin in the early in fifty two or fifty three. Yep. So that was, um, but that car rusted away. And since then, I've always I wanted a particular car. I, in fact, this 
car coincidentally is um, sits next to my computer here at my home office. If you're, if you're um, listening to the podcast, Byron is actually holding up a, a scale model of the car. Or it's, that's you know, right. It's a, it's a tiny version of it. So it's uh, this scale car. model is also a uh, 1959 uh, Morris 1000, as its um, official name is. And I wanted a two-door, and I wanted something in a very 50s kind of madman kind of hue. And it's taken me <clears throat> probably the best part of 15 years to just – um, have it kind of bubbling as a, as a search thing on the side. And finally, the other day, um, on my day off, uh, it popped up. And I called the owner. Uh, it was a bit of toing and froing, And I finally found the car I wanted. And this is it. So I haven't driven it yet. So we'll, you'll have to wait till a future um, podcast to know what it's like. Um, but the Morris Minor is a rear-wheel drive, a very simple um, torsion bar suspended, leaf sprung, rear suspended, uh, family car from the 50s. It was the best-selling uh, car in, in the UK in the 50s. It was hugely popular pretty much everywhere where Britain colonised during that time. And a lot of older people have got relatives, aunts, uncles, whatever, who um, had these cars. They were just absolutely commonplace. I finally got one and... I just love looking at it. And just, by the way, it was designed by the same person and engineered by the same person who created the Mini and those... Um, those uh, uh, was it Ital Italian, wasn't it? Well, Alec Sigonis uh, was the engineer who yeah. engineered the Morris Minor. It was meant to be... The, it was the codename Morris Mosquito, by the way, um, back in 1948. Um, oh, well, those dangerous animal, but yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in the 60s, the, uh, the front-wheel drive cars were... Um, were designed by some of them were designed by Penny Farina, such as the Morris 1100, mm. which I also have at home. So I'm a bit of a BMC fan. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Now, look, my the car that I've been driving is probably around about the same size as your yeah, Izzy Morris Minor. It's been a Mazda CX3. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you know, it would have a lot less uh, headroom than your 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 humpy little Morris Minor. Um, the CX3, oh man, I know this car so well, I could probably build one. Um, I've been doing an urban, urban test with it. And wow, it's um, the Max Sport grade. Uh, what can I tell you? $27,640. It's got a two liter engine. It's got an auto six speed um, transmission. The, the engine's really good. It's, it's really responsive. The transmission's great. Um, it, drives, it drives well. Um, the ride is a little bit pogo stick because of that short wheelbase um if you hit a speed bump a little bit faster than the suggested serving suggestion on the sign um it does this <laughs> thing um i'm not gonna do that again um <laughs> i went to the easter show in it um last friday uh, just just gone no didn't last sunday it doesn't really matter anyway. to visit to visit jc just yeah to visit to jc, JC. That was his ride Oh, I tell you what, I mean, I, I mean, I, I got pins and needles in my leg after a while because he doesn't put you down for, a, you know, for some time, but it was great. It was everything that, you know, the, the, well, I was freaking out. I, um, that's what it's called. And then I got it, got freaked out. Um, but um, <laughs> I wasn't freaked out by the CX-3. I was a bit disappointed in the amount of space because we took two cars uh, because um, we had a lot of people going and I took my parents in the CX-3. So I had my dad in the front because he doesn't bend very well. So he had to sit in the front seat and mum sat in the back seat behind me. And if you ever met my mum um, and we do Terry tests with her occasionally, she's massive. I mean, I want to say <laughs> massive. she's tall. She's very tall. She's like me. She's Viking. And um, so she was sitting behind me and um there wasn't a lot of room and I could, I could feel her knees digging into my back. And it's been a long time since I've felt that. Um, so what was the other car option? Our home, our home car. Our, so look, believe it or not, and we've proven this today, you know, motoring journalists do own their own cars. We do. Uh, I've got a 1951 Ford uh, twin spinner. And we've also got a uh, 2017 Skoda, uh, rapid space back. My wife took the space back. We probably should have taken the space back instead of CX3. But I wanted to, you know, you, you got to use these cars, you got to test them. Um, so look, the CX3 was a bit small for us, just the three of us going to the Easter show. Mm -hmm. I reckon, I think if you're thinking about it, maybe think about a CX30. It's almost like they made the CX3 and they've gone, oh, 
Yeah, I'll let's do it again, but we'll call it the CX30. Hmm. Or an um, S class. Or an S class. Oh my God, that would have been luxurious. Good option. Um, mm. Yeah, look, I mean, it's not particularly luxurious, but the Max Sport, I think, is 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 the grade. Max Sport is kind of Max Sport or Touring seems to be the grade in all Mazda lineups to go for. You don't need the, you know, the top of the line, top of the line Azami or whatever they want to call it. Um, so, um, look, it's been it's been fine, just just a little bit small. Yeah. Um, but now it's time for I think one of our most popular segments. It's the feedback segment. Uh, last week, uh, our podcast looked at the Ford Evos. It's a car which Ford's going to be bringing to Australia, which is kind of taking the place of the Endura, uh, that five-seater mid-sized or large SUV, which kind of was here to take the place of the territory, but really didn't do the job. It was diesel only, and then they got rid of it. Now, this Evos is, um, you know, looks very Mondeo-ish. Uh, it's this, it's, it's, it looks like it's the right size. It's more of a crossover, to use that term I don't like, than an SUV and an upright SUV. Um, and the feedback we got was, was pretty much what we expected. Um, we've got Grodlin74, and he, he came out and said, Ford also need the F-150 in Australia and the Bronco, not just the sport version here soon. And he's gone all like Holden, dot, 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 dot. Um, <laughs> Grudlin, I think I think he's right actually because we were talking about how look we don't want the Evos really we don't need another Escape or Puma or, or you know something like that we actually want big seven seat you know SUVs like a Sorento but with a Ford badge. Um, Grudlin's a uh, same day um, also to another 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 comment um, and if you want to leave your feedback um, just do so uh, at the at the um, uh, below the, the YouTube version of the podcast. Um, he says, just because he's silly doesn't mean he hasn't got the smarts to do it. Um, a motto to live by, thank you, Richard. We were talking about um, Elon Musk and how even though he's, he's pretty crazy in what he says and does, um, you know, he's obviously pretty smart. He knows what he's doing. Um, so um, and we we're going to get to Musk watch later because he's doing some other wacky stuff. Um, another one, oh, the cool K, um, well, the cook. Is that your name? Um, I think it's the cool K. Um, it's not. Um, he says, he says, amen, Richard, about the Explorer. I was talking about how, look, we just bring the Explorer out here. Um, the cook says, I think I mentioned it sometime last year. I was shocked to hear that Europe is getting it and we're not. And it's super low cost to bring it here and support the sales of Ranger and Mustang. I, guys, I think Explorer in Australia would sell like a cake that was hot. Um, don't you don't you reckon? You know, it would have to, right? It's a big SUV. It's got a Ford badge. It'd have to sell. I don't know. I think they've got um, they've got the Everest, which I know it's uh, more of a four wheel drive than an SUV. If there's a delineation to be made there, uh, and but I like, yeah, of course, a big Ford that looks tough. Um, that could sit alongside a Ranger in your driveway would probably sell well. Um, yeah. Probably sell better than an Evos, which I'm taking it as like a Subaru Outback style rival. Um, but then again, Subaru Outback, new generation version, you wouldn't necessarily tell it from uh, a quick glance, but uh, it was the biggest selling car in its segment last month. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, we can't underestimate that. And it's only available with a 2.5 litre petrol and yep. all-wheel drive. So uh, we can't underestimate that there's demand for all sorts of things that sit three inches higher than a standard car. <laughs> correct, correct. I completely agree. Um, however, I, I think that Ford really is missing a trick. So I'm, I'm with Richard here. The Explorer, as you know, is a rear-wheel drive platform vehicle as well as all-wheel um, all drive optional. And... I mean, shades of territory there or what? Like mm. the car will go up against Klugers and Palisades and Sorrentos and Santa Fe's and, and that sort of thing. And that market is massive. I think there is room in Ford's lineup to have uh, a car-based SUV, mm -hmm. seven and the uh, off-road towing um, capability that the Everest represents. So those cars are quite different. Yeah. Um, the Everest is still such a good thing, by the way. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've got to say... While the um, the Evos, which by the way hasn't been confirmed for Australia, so um, and that was my story, so it's 
<laughs> it's it's <Sorry>. it is speculative. <laughs> it is speculative. So, um, but you know, this is a car that is is definitely meant to be Ford's global mm. family car proposition mm. to go up against um, an an Outback type thing, but with with more style. That would be smaller again. So, um, I, I feel that you know we don't want to get away from passenger cars too far. We don't want, you know, um, trucks and SUVs to completely take over the world. So having the dreaded crossover style family car that handles and steers and rides and has a refinement and the safety and the affordability of a passenger car, I think that definitely should be here as well. Well, look, um, I, I disagree. Um, and, um, I, and I said so last week in the podcast, I said, look, the EVOS will, I, I said, look, it would, it would have 12 months uh, and it would go the same way as the Endura. And, um, and I, and then I apologize for being a, a, a death whisperer or speaker <laughs> because, um, you, you know, you shouldn't say those type of things, I guess. But anyway, but Grudlin, Grudlin's actually come out again. And he said, Grudlin 74, he says, no need for Richard to be the death speaker. Oh. We have trained everyone into utes, SUVs, and maybe some hatches like the spiritual ancestor of Falcon becoming the RAV4. <laughs> me, something tells me Grudlin knows, uh, knows quite a lot about uh, the industry. Dan mm. T uh, replies here saying, if Ford could produce an SUV that is a patrol cr- in, the, in the patrol cruiser space, I think they could do very well for all markets, from soccer mums to grey nomads, towing the 3,500 to 4,000 kilo caravans doing the big lap. And that's true as well. I mean, there is the Everest. Um, but they don't have a they don't have a you know a, a patrol or cruiser uh, competitor out there, do they? Not here, no, no, no. Uh, and by you know, I I don't know that there's uh, too big of a market there. Um, I know that you know the patrol does well um, considering what it is and the mm. fact that it isn't diesel; um, it's petrol only. Uh, and then you've got the, the Land Cruiser 200 series, which, you know, you, you couldn't get enough of those cars to sell here. And mm. people are buying them and then selling them for thirty or $40,000 profit right now because the demand is so huge because yeah. everyone wants the last of the V8 diesel um, yes. or V8 petrol. Um, but, yeah, look, I think there's probably uh, very limited potential for anything huge like that from Ford. But I'm willing to be surprised um, if, if they've got something up their sleeve. Yeah, well, they've got the Bronco. And, you know, the Bronco is, I know it's a bit smaller than a, a, a 200 series or a, or a Patrol. Um, but that car uses Australian DNA in the T6 platform that underpins the Ranger and the Everest. Um, so... Mm. I think it's halfway there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. why not bring it in? And the, and the Wrangler does fairly good business. Mm. You know, it, I think that Ford really, just really needs to, um, to bring its international uh, offerings that clearly speak to consumers there. Because the Bronco, there's like, what's the waiting list on those things? Eighteen months now in, mm. in the US and, and counting. It, I, I reckon that they would have a, a, a smash hit on their hands here. That's what I think. But. Mm. Maybe that's why I'm not a product planner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Grudlin is back again. He says the Cayenne saved Porsche from bankruptcy. And, you, you know, you could say the same thing about, you know, the Levante for, you know, Maserati, the, um, you know, the SUV lineups for Jaguar, you know, F-Pace, E-Pace, I-Pace. Um, and, and same with a lot of SUVs have saved, saved you know, some companies which just made money out of um, passenger cars originally. Well, look um, at Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi is another example. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Marla has said, great point, Ari, after sales service. We were talking about how um, a bad experience at a dealership can completely ruin it for, for somebody who's buying a car. You know, you walk into a, you know, a dealership, you get treated really badly, you walk out, and you walk into another dealership and they're nice to you, you end up buying that car just because they've said, come on in, would you like a cup of coffee? How's your day been? And the last dealership, you waited for half an hour before anyone even looked in your direction. Um, and Stuart Marler says, what really bewilders me is that car brands spend so much on marketing, market research, product placement, planning, sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they can't get somebody into a dealership um, to give someone proper service. He says, I see this process as a filter. The marketing is broadcast to millions of people, 
more targeted marketing might target 100,000 people, then get a small portion, small portion of this into a dealership where a further portion of them drop out on, of the race on account of product fit and pricing, and they go through all this to sell a car. Then they'll penny pinch on a hunt on a hundred dollar flingy under warranty, alternate someone who has already gone through that process through the filter and proven themselves to be a good fit for the brand and having a productivity to buy their product. So basically what he's saying that is if you finally make it through all of that, then you are the right person to buy that car. Well, but, I mean, <laughs> there's there's a, a quite a bit of uh, research that I've read about the fact that people want a new car. They just don't want to have to go and buy it. Like yes. they don't want to have to go to a dealership and sit there for four hours doing all the paperwork. They, they just want to do it from home. And that's where the market's moving. Uh, we're going to see more and more online purchasing and online mm. service offering as well. So people will come and get your car, take it away, do the service, bring yep. it back to you. Yep. This is convenience culture. This is where we're living now. And this is how it's going to continue, I think. I think what you're going to see as well is a fixed price as well in the future there'll be no more bargaining negotiating with dealers who are trying to you know talk you up or talk you down you walk into a dealership you don't know the price i think it'll be like an iphone or you know some whatever you'll walk in that'll be the price and that's the price you'll pay um tgv says uh ford motor company need to stop mucking around with the australian market and give buyers the explorer the bronco sport and the Bronco, stop mucking around, he says, with the right-hand drive markets and give buyers what they really want. While Puma or Escape are fine vehicles, they're clearly not what the current Ford buyer wants. If Ford wants to knock off the Toyota Rev4, they really need the Bronco Sport, which should really be given the name Maverick. As the Escape can't match the Rav4, also, where is the Escape Fev? True. Where where is the Escape plug-in um, hybrid as well? It's just it's coming. Uh, it is. <laughs> It's not, look, my, it's not behind my computer, is it? Can you see it? <laughs> no, no, I couldn't see it. Uh, uh, sorry, Dukulka's replied saying it's rather like the Mazda CX-8, bigger than the Rev4, but not the size of Santa Fe yet. Uh, Stuart Marler's replied again. And then we've got one from Brad Parker. says, I am a confused Santa Fe owner and seeking some mental adjustment from the tools. Ooh. In this episode, James calls the brand Hyundai, which is what the Americans are officially told to call it. We call it Hyundai after being re-educated from what we were originally told, and that was Hyundai. I know it's Mazda, Mazda, but come on, does the OEM actually know how to pronounce their own names? Can we please get some clarity on this controversial topic, he says. Now, Byron and, and Matt, what's the answer? Is it, is it Hyundai, 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 Mazda, Subaru? <laughs> what are the real Nissan. names? Um, I, I say it's Hyundai uh, because that's how Hyundai's representatives say the brand name in Australia. Yep. James says Hyundai because largely... It's pretentious? I think he's, I think he's taking the piss. Yes, uh, he's taking, he's taking <laughs> because it. Because that's, that's James's uh, sense of humour. Uh, yep. I don't think he's intentional. Like, he wouldn't intentionally call the brand Hyundai in a video <laughs> if he was doing a video <laughs> review, for example. Um, but, yeah... Uh, I think in Australia it's Hyundai and I think it's Mazda and I think it's Nissan and I think it's Mitsubishi. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's, the, it's, a, it's partly the brand's fault. When they launched in 1986, their campaign was say hi to Hyundai. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you are a Kath and Kim fan like me, they still like to hightail it in their Hyundai. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that kind of perpetuates, I think, the confusion. But you're right, mate. It's Hyundai. There you go, Brad Parker. Thank you for that comment. I mean, look, it's like uh, my six-year-old son said to me the other day, um, you know, these, we're looking at a book on dinosaurs and he goes, these aren't the names. The dinosaurs? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, that's it's not pterodactyl. I'm like, it is a pterodactyl. Look at it. He goes, no, that's what we call it. What did it call itself? <laughs> so, I mean, maybe maybe we need to ask a Korean how they pronounce Hyundai or, a you know, a Japanese person how they pronounce Mazda. Maybe that's the the answer to that question. Anyway, Brad, I hope we helped there. Um, and a very, very last one from TGV, a massive fail. I love him. He's so emotional. Massive fail on the Mustang brand name for the Mark E. It would have been so much better if Ford did the rebirth Falcon thing and chosen to be the Ford Motor Company. Electric cars, regardless of hybrid battery and fuel cell hydrogen, brand name since Falcon was the choice for the compact midsize, 
which took on its own identity as the family car of the future back then, which would work in today's market. The Falcon marquee sounds so much better than the Mustang marquee, which, as we all know, has been universally given the thumbs down as a brand name. Hmm. I just think the marquee just sounds like a big tent and it's always just going to sound like a big tent. So oh, who's uh, going to call it marquee? People are going to say it's a Mac E. Yeah. Yeah. Mac. Mac. Yeah. Uh, look, I, uh, I don't know. The, the initial for sales figures for the marquee suggest that Ford's done the right thing in, um, in, yeah. in the States and Canada and in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Personally, I think it's a stroke of genius. Um, I think Mustang has always been a brand to its own and there's no reason why it can't be a two-door sports car or a SUV. Um, I think it's going to go great guns. Now, talking of great guns and rockets, it's time for Must Watch. This week, Elon Musk's SpaceX launched a rocket which didn't explode. Yep, Elon threw another bucket load of mini satellites into orbit. Now, this is part of his Starlink satellite internet service. Now, when I say a bucket load, I'm, I'm serious. So they, they packed 60 tiny satellites the size of a laptop, a lunchbox, into the, the nose cone of a Falcon 9 rocket, and they released it into the wilds of space. Well, low, low, earth, low earth orbit. Um, it's the 24th batch of internet satellites that he's sent up so far. And what Elon wants to do is he wants to put 42,000 of these mini satellites in orbit. Um, so what the, the idea is, is that he's going to have a global coverage of fast, um, high-speed internet. Um, so far, there's 1,320 of them in orbit. And the footage is freaky because as the nose cone opens up, these it looks like the attack of the clones or something. These little satellites sort of like come out on their like little whatever that is um it's trajectory. amazing trajectory it's yeah. the, look it's freaky it's almost like you know an evil genius is surrounding the planet with his robots and it's almost like that isn't it <laughs> it's totally it's almost a, like that it's, it's straight out of the season three spoiler uh, end of doctor who where you know yeah yeah i can Right in front of our very eyes. Yeah. So this Falcon, this Falcon 9 rocket has been re it's a reusable rocket. It's been used six times. And after each launch, it lands on a drone ship. The drone ship is called, of course, I still love you. Um, and it's amazing. The ship's about the size of a football field. Uh, the Falcon 9 rocket comes down. The ship catches it. It's a completely autonomous ship. It knows where the rocket's going to be. And it kind of does this. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm doing the catching a ball thing coming down. Um, the next big job for the Falcon 9 is going to be launching a crew to the International Space Station on April 22. Um, so, yeah, look, it appears that um, SpaceX, at least, is, is going great guns. Now, it wouldn't be Musk Watch without seeing what Elon has been tweeting. So, um, on Thursday this week, he tweeted, To be clear, I do support vaccines in general and COVID vaccines specifically. The science is unequivocal. In very rare cases, there is an allergic reaction, but this is easily addressed with an EpiPen. Um, I think that's in response to, um, oh, look, his, his views on the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, he's, he's often, I think, tweets before he thinks. Uh, so he's just being absolutely clear there. Um, same day, he, he tweeted, tanks for the memory, Panzer of the lake. Now, I had to look this one up because I'm not completely up on my memes, but there's a meme at the moment of a tank sitting in a lake and it's a photo of, I think it's a World War II soldier or a World War I soldier looking at the tank half submerged in this lake and it's he's asking the tank for wisdom and the tank is just offering it from the lake. You, it's, it's like all memes, it's very visual. You've got to get it. <laughs> You've got to get it. So he's tweeted tanks for tanks for the memory. Um, on April 5, he uh, tweeted, the earth is flat. It's a hollow globe and Donkey Kong lives there. Now, this is in re reference to the Godzilla versus King Kong movie, uh, which he loved apparently because he also tweeted about it. Um, he's written, Godzilla, Godzilla versus Kong is so amazed much. Wow, most insane movie I've ever seen. 
love letter to conspiracy theorists and yet a heartwarming in the end. Um, yes. <laughs> I have I have a sneaking suspicion that he may have partly funded that movie. Oh, really? And this is just a guess, but, you know, for him to uh, come out and talk about a, a movie yeah. that's just launched, um, he doesn't do things just to do things. He does things yeah. to make money. Yeah, you know what? You're right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's it because he came out and talked about the Blade Runner, um, not the Blade Runner game, um, uh, something else, and it was, you know, a feature in one of his cars, and it's like, hmm, yeah, you're right, exactly. Like, look, he, yep, he might be silly, but doesn't mean he's got the, hasn't got the smarts <laughs> to do the right yeah. job. Um, most recently, Elon tweeted, "Thanks, Tesla suppliers, for providing us with critical parts." Now, this is a really, this is, this looks like a really boring tweet, but I think there's more to it. Thanks, Tesla suppliers, for providing us with critical parts. Now, right now, worldwide, there is a part shortage. In fact, there's a car supply shortage. Um, COVID has messed up, you know, obviously, um, production logistics routes. Um, at the moment, there's a three to six month wait on, on, you know, a Toyota RAV4, which would normally take three to six days to, to be delivered after you've ordered it. Um, Elon somehow is managing to get his batteries supplied to him without any major issues. So he gets his batteries supplied by LG, um, also Panasonic, and in the in China by KTEL or CATL. Uh, and somehow they've managed to come through um, in this really, really difficult time. Mm. Now, so it looks like Tesla is forging ahead, but maybe not so much in Australia. Um, now, the Tesla Semi might not be coming here, and can you guess why? Because uh, it's fake. No. <laughs> no. And it's not because of um, fears about battery range, I believe. No, it's not. It's too wide. It's too wide for Australian roads. Now, Australian oh. law says that a vehicle can't be more than 2.5 metres wide. 2.5 metres wide. And the Tesla Semi is 34 millimetres wider than it needs to be. Um, so Tesla has made a submission to the Australian Transport Commission asking that the law be relaxed for no. their Semi. <laughs> no. The roads aren't wide enough. Is the, the, the Between the lines there, like literally, <laughs> the roads aren't wide enough to cope with your truck being that wide. It's a safety thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! You know, it's like fun. seriously, like there's, there's not a lot of space between you and the car going 110 k's an hour in the opposite direction. Just a couple, literally enough space for a double yellow line. Mm. Um, and that thing will slice you open, won't it? If it is. Oh yeah! Oh the yeah! Audacity of the bloke. Anyway, well, this is how he gets things done. Yeah. Uh, look, in the, he's 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 argued that in the US and European Union, vehicle size limits allow the semi to um, to, to be sold there. My God, you know, there are some European roads I've driven on which that semi is definitely not going to fit. No way. Um, so the jury is still out on that one. Is the, is the semi coming to Australia? What do you what do you think? Should should the semi come to Australia? Would Australian truckies laugh at it or would they adopt it? Um, you know, it looks, I don't know, it looks pretty cool to me, but, you know, I, I can't actually see a bloke pulling up at a truck stop or a, or a Sheila. In, in the Tesla Semi, but maybe they might. Maybe they might. I mean, uh, uh, by all accounts, a lot of people going into trucking in Australia that have been previously accountants or from, you know, paper pushing jobs and they're taking up roles as truck drivers, maybe they would adop adopt a Semi. Would you adopt a Semi? You know? Look, it, it, maybe you can start an adoption drive. <laughs> <laughs> that, thing, yeah. that thing needs to come to Australia because if it makes, it means quieter vehicles like semis on highway. Uh, that's true. I lived I lived beside a highway most of my childhood, and it's probably one of the reasons why you know um, I can't hear properly. Um, and it's just the the sound of air brakes, you know, yeah. like that's just you know, and it goes right through a wall. So I've got to admit, although I love combustion engines, I think a world with with electric motors is going to be a lot more serene. Mm. Um, yep. So maybe Especially the garbage trucks. Oh my. God, garbage no. trucks are so loud. Oh. That's right. <laughs> now we're back to the Tesla share price. Tesla is selling for six hundred and seventy dollars and ninety-seven cents per share. That's up thirty-five dollars and thirty-five cents 
Uh, it was $635.62 last week. Now, a senior researcher, there's always a senior research analyst mm-hmm. coming out and talking. Anyway, this one from Roth Capital said Tesla's stock is overvalued. Oh. Well, obviously, um, and is actually only worth $150. Um, <laughs> now, he's, look, he's, he's right, you know, um, not the almost $700 it is. Now, he says Tesla itself is valued at $660 billion. And he says that's close to the total size of the US and European car industry combined. That's, <sighs> that is outrageous. And that is, that is completely, completely yep. overvalued. And the thing is, like we've said it before, we'll say it again, Tesla's not just a car company, it's a data company, it's a technology company. That's right. It's an insurance company. It's everything uh, rolled into one. There's a lot more to Tesla than just the Model 3 that you occasionally see in your suburb. Exactly. All right. With that, we've reached the finish line and I want to say thank you to you, Matt. Thank you. And thank you, Byron. Thank you, Richard. And, what a great job you did today, mate. Oh, yeah, it was thank fun. you, guys. Well, look, it wasn't all me. It was you guys. And, of course, it was also Mr. Pritchard. You can't see him because he sits behind or just under the desk here. Um, <laughs> he's our producer. And he's back. He's back from his family gathering down in Tasmania. It's a biannual thing where Pritchards from all over the world meet in the, in the family windmill. And he's only just got off the bus back because he doesn't fly. That's his rule. He never <laughs> flies. So he's just got off the bus back. And so he's still wearing the Pritchard family tartan kilt. Look at him down there. Yep. He's wearing the long white socks and the life jacket with the built-in flare gun. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard, for your expertise today. Now, let us know your thoughts. You can find us on Cars Guide or Facebook or Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel. Uh, You can stay on top of all of our latest content that way. Now, before we go, I've got to tell a joke. Um, And I always tell this joke because I think it's really funny. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So there's two fish and they're sitting in a tank, right? And we're not sitting in a tank, they're floating in a tank. (laughs) And... um, Floating? What? They're not... Or fishing. They're, they're, they're swimming. Fishing. They're, they're just, just swimming. being fish. Because, yeah, you know, floating yeah. fish, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's something else. Sitting. Yeah, It could yeah. be sitting. And um, and I think I've ruined it now. And the like, one fish turns to the other and says, hey, do you know how to drive this thing? Get it. It's a tank. Oh, it's a tank. So, and it's a bit of a reference to the um, t- pan, tank pans, I mean, as well. I thought that'd be... Thanks for the memory. No worries. <laughs> it's thanks, a good thing. Thanks for listening, everybody. Oh.